where it's Adam and Eve leave God's present sacred space, they come to the world of thorns and thistles. Jesus is now reversing the fall because that's what the temple does. We're leaving the space of thorns and thistles, going through the wall and into his space. And as soon as I get there, what do I see? The tree. The tree. Fruits. What does Nephi see in First Nephi 8? The preeminent the bit. Now, now listen fruit. to this. This might be crazy. So, sorry if you guys think this is crazy. If they think it's you, crazy, they turned it off an hour ago. Yeah, it's <laughs> true. <laughs> Boy, and there are four, so that's also provocative. And uh, I'm having a stroke it, here. We're gonna, it looks really simple, so that's because it's wrong. I feel like I'm close to Kolob. <laughs> by, by the way, by the way, verse 11. Time does not exist. Welcome, welcome, one and all, to the Stick of Joseph YouTube channel. Today, we are diving into part two of our interview with David Butler, talking about the Sermon on the Mount and whether or not it is an ancient temple ritual that would be familiar to endowed members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. If you haven't watched the first part of this episode, pause right now, go ahead, watch that one, because it'll make this one make a whole lot more sense. And guess what, guys? We had a seven-hour conversation with this guy, so we have <laughs> more, to come. more to come later on where we actually talk about the Tree of Life vision and how that applies to the ancient temple ritual as well. So stay tuned. But as many of you know, we are doing a giveaway right now on our channel for our Patreon support. So on February 1st, we're going to be announcing two winners of the giveaway. The first one is going to win this. It is an artifact from the time of Lehi that was actually used to destroy Jerusalem as Lehi prophesied. And the second winner is going to win an annotated edition of the Book of Mormon. It has really cool study helps in there that will enhance your Come Follow Me study Wait, this I year. Wait, I have some news. What? We are choosing a third winner that is going to win one of these Christ pendants from the Risen Shop. Something super simple and beautiful that you can wear that will help remind you of who it is all about. And to enter this giveaway, it's super simple. You go to the link down below and subscribe to the Sick of Joseph Patreon. $1 a month will get you one entry to the giveaway. $3 a month will get you three entries into the giveaway and will also give you access to our Discord community where we discuss everything Book of Mormon, whether it's different theories on the geography or just the delicious doctrine that you find inside of it. And we had one of our Discord members popping in our interview the other day. Ooh, that's going to be coming cool. up soon. But anyway, subscribing to the Lehigh tier of $5 a month We'll get you five entries to the giveaway, access to our Discord community, all of our content ad-free, and in podcast form so you don't have to have your YouTube open to listen to these awesome interviews. So enough of our blabbing. Let's get into today's video. So uh, Matthew 6, we start out with five verses about doing alms, but we have a major problem here. Mm -hmm. The word that is translated uh, alms actually is two different words underneath it. Two different words are translated as alms. Okay. Okay. The first is dikaiosune, which appears once and first. Mm -hmm. Dikaiosune means justice. Am I right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Justice. Um, okay. So the first time that, that Ma the King James says alms, take heed that not to do your justice before, before men. men. The rest of the times, the word is elemosune, which means mercy. Mm. Uh, it does have the sense of alms, like we talk about. This is not a real common word, but elemosinary institutions are institutions that are designed to be charitable. It's not a real common word. No. Um, but if we were like 19th century wasps in, you know, the Hudson Valley or something, we <laughs> would say that, that kind was. of thing, yeah. right? So, but it's justice and mercy. Okay, now this is really interesting. Um, so first of all, notice we're getting this instruction right at the hinge. We're going from one room into the next because we're going to see when we go from room two into three, we again get a teaching on justice. Yeah. Okay, so justice at these two moments, at the hinges. Secondly, the order of it is it goes justice and then it goes mercy, mercy, mercy. And I, and I, I want to, here's my hypothesis, okay? I think each of the three rooms is associated with um there, there are a series of three-part sequences. So each room is associated with a priest, okay? Mm -hmm. And it's Moses, Elijah, the Lord. Yeah. Each room is associated with a kind of a legal idea. And the first room is the room of justice. You've just come through the room of justice. You saw Moses. He reminded you that you've got to keep the law. You started agreeing to covenants. What's justice? Well, justice is I get what I deserve. Mm -hmm. So if I break the law, I get punishment. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So even the agreeing with your adversary, it's like you're you're the one who has to rectify with your adversary because that's justice. That's that's right. the room of justice, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And so it's all feeling very heavy. You get here to this hinge this hinge moment, and there's a teaching about yes, justice, but mercy, mercy, mercy. Because the second room is the room of mercy. It's the mercy where we're going to meet the the sun is going to show up for the first time, mm-hmm. or we're going to have the feast with God. Yeah. Okay. So the the I think the 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 sequence goes just as mercy and we'll see a different kind of idea and play in the in third. the uh, in the third room. By the way, the spiritual gift sequence also we'll do this a little bit out of order. Yeah. I think the spiritual gift of the first room is faith. Now, faith is defined multiple times. The book of 1st Nephi is the book of faith. Yeah. Because without using that word, I think four times Nephi defines faith. Okay? Um, and the first time I think is uh, First Nephi three seven maybe uh, I I I obeyed because I knew the Lord would not give a commandment unless He made a way mm-hmm. that we could do, do it. it. Right, I'm paraphrasing, mm-hmm. but that's what it says. Mm-hmm. That Nephi says that four different times in First Nephi, and there's and there's a series of stories that illustrate that over and over again. That's who Nephi is. He's the guy who's like, yes, God commands, I will do it. I don't know how I'm going to go into Jerusalem and get this, but I'm going to go anyway. I don't know how I'm going to build a boat. I'm going to go anyway. I don't. I don't know how to this wooden bow. I'm going to get mm-hmm. food for my. I'm going to go anyway, right? Yeah. So trust. Uh, yeah. It's it's so it's God doesn't give a commandment unless He makes a way that you should do it. Now, mm-hmm. um, without going and reading all the scriptures, because we've we need to conserve time. Yeah. Um, Ether twelve is a discourse on faith, hope, and charity, but mostly it's on faith. Yeah, it says right. like 30 something times. Yeah. Yeah. Uh and uh by faith you can do this and that and the other thing and you move mountains and do all this stuff, right? Faith is the power that lets you do what you need to do. Mm-hmm. Now, maybe, okay, maybe there will come a day when when God says, "Dave, move Squaw Peak." Mm-hmm. Or to race, save my family, I have to move Squaw Peak. Okay? But most of the time, that's not what I need to do. Mm-hmm. Most of the time, what I need to do is keep my covenants. Yeah. And fa- room one, Moses, justice, the spiritual gift is promised is, hey, if you uh, accept a covenant, uh, God makes it possible. It doesn't matter how difficult it seems to you to turn the other cheek, to love your enemy, Right to respect the teachings of the law of chastity, you can do it, right? So, uh, all right. So we're getting in the second room. So, which is going to be the room of mercy? It's going to be the room of hope. Okay. Now, verses five through eight, we get actually five through thirteen, we get instructions on prayer. But let's notice something. So, if we look at verses five, let's see, am I in the right chapter? No, I'm still in Matthew five. So. Um, if we get into uh, verse five, I got to get my English back up here. Um, who is Jesus talking to when he starts to give instructions on prayer here? And not verse five, verse six, really. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, verse six, really. He's giving instructions on to prayer. us, yeah, to every each individual, to each individual, yes. Right, thou, but thou, when thou prayest, that's that's your Spanish two or your German do, right? Mm-hmm. It's you, one person. When thou prayest, what you know, go in the closet, pray in quiet. Okay. Verses five through eight are instructions on your personal prayer. Yeah. Then we're gonna shift in verse nine. Okay. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Ye. Mm-hmm. Who is ye? Is that you all? That's y'all. Okay. Who means? Okay. Or, or all y'all, depending on what mm-hmm. part of the South you're yeah, in. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it is it's a plural you. It's ustedes. It's voy. It's, voy, it's vosotros. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so, I, hey, instructions on uh, your personal prayer and then instructions on your group prayer. So we're being brought together for like a group prayer here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and he get and we get a prayer, and this is this is the Lord's prayer. Our, our you know, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, right? Um, now I want to notice verse eleven. You got to do eleven, bro. Verse eleven is just really good. Okay. Um. So verse eleven, part of this prayer that we're praying as a group. 
Okay. Again, remember, th- this, this is an ordinance, so we should imagine that there's a group of worshipers together saying a prayer together. And it's interesting because he's like, after this manner, pray thee. Now, the Catholics, they think it's like, and a lot of people, it's like, oh, forever we're going to just say this prayer over and over yeah. again. But he's, he's, it's another way of saying that is like, hey, say what I'm saying. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Or maybe In after this moment, manner, what he means is, I'm showing you movements or a way to assemble yourself mm. right and then we say a group prayer together in a certain way maybe it's a call and response i say a word you say a word yeah or maybe it's both right so because there's 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 clearly if the hypothesis is correct there's stuff here that's in the text and then there's a person would have to bring their knowledge to the text mm-hmm. to know what it meant yeah it's I feel getting, like I'm close to Kolob. But by the way, by the way, verse eleven Time does not exist. Verse on this eleven, white I had table. never seen this. And then when we were talking, because I was in my, I think I was in my first or second year of Greek. Yeah. And my mind blew up because I'm like, because I, because I had spent some time in Exodus three, you know. Yep. Ahe. Asher Ahe. Asher Ahe. Yeah. Anyway, so and then and then I was doing this in the Greek, and I'm like, that's exactly everything you're about to say. So I should stop talking. Okay. Okay. Right. Get to it. So, uh, okay, Matthew six eleven is awesome. Okay, okay, okay. yeah, Un- understatement. Yeah, it yeah. seems pretty simple though. Yeah, yeah real. It looks day. really simple. Yeah. So yeah. that's because it's wrong. So uh, give us this day our daily bread. Now the problem is the, the the King James translators are are facing a word in here that it's difficult to translate or it's not obvious to them. Okay, okay, and that word is epiusios. And uh, one of the one of the difficult things is this is this is what is called a hapax legomenon, which means mm. a word that only appears once. Hapax okay? legomenon. And not and 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 in particular, it only appears once in the New Testament. So ordinarily, so one if you're trying, time. One time, you're trying to figure out like what does a word mean. You go well. Here's how it, what it says here. Let me go look at other places where it's used. And, and I can figure out the meaning. But this doesn't have that. It, but it's weird because I look at all those words and I'm like, these words are very, very common. Super right? simple, right? It seems very straightforward. Epiusios. Okay. Epi. And this is for uh, what's translated as daily. bread. Or daily. No, daily. Okay. Bread is yeah. bread. Okay. But daily is this word epiusios. So uh, you heard epi before. It's your epidermis mm-hmm. or your epiglottis. Okay. Yeah. It's things that are upon. Or on top of or a p and epi in Greek is upon real simple and yep. plain, but it even it translates in English. Right, mm-hmm. right. Um, usios is the verb to be, and it's a participle. So usios means existent, or that is. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's it's upon existent or upon the existent one. Now the. The thing that the King James translators have decided, which is not completely nuts, yeah. okay? They're trying to figure out what does this mean, and they go, well, this means the existent day. So give us the bread that is upon, that is for the existing day. So daily, so your day, okay. A daily yeah. bread. That's how they have tried to understand this. Except that the name Yahweh, Jehovah, is the verb to be in Hebrew. Yeah. Okay? Now, exactly how it's the verb to be is debated. It's some kind of participle. It, me- it means the existent one or the one who causes to be. So this is in, in uh, Exodus 3, Moses goes on top of the mountain and he sees the burning bush and a voice says, Echie, share Echie, I am that I am. Mm-hmm. Okay? And, and scholars very commonly say, well, this is, this is where God is introducing himself for the first time as Yahweh. Well, he doesn't actually say Yahweh. He says, I am yeah. that I am, right? Mm-hmm. But, but everyone recognizes, well, Yahweh is somehow the one that says, the, that means I am or to be, right? You also see this in the Gospel of John. Um, I want to say six or seven times uh, you have what are called I am statements where Jesus says, I am, but the, like uh, mm-hmm. John eight yeah. before Abraham was, I, I am. am. They're all offended, not because he's saying he's older than Abraham. That just makes you kooky, because yeah. he's saying I am Jehovah. Yeah. Okay. But my favorite is in the garden. So I can't remember John twenty or something, and um, they're coming to get him, and and they say, "Are are you Jesus? We have a warrant." And he says, "I am," and they fall down. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, because the power 
of him saying of that statement. Yeah, and also the 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 connection, the the other image in there is that on the day of atonement, the high priest came out of the temple and pronounced the name, and everyone bowed oh, down. Mm. Right. So this is Jesus's moment of revelation. On I the am day the of high atonement. priest. Oh. I am the Lord. Oh, everyone falls down, right? So the name Yahweh somehow is connected to the verb to be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Epiusio's bread is not the the bread for the day. It's the Yahweh bread. Hmm. Give me the bread that Yahweh is upon. Okay. Now, which is, by the way, tied right back into the Eucharist. Which, which this is this is the Eucharist, right? Right. So Mm -hmm. again, um. I don't know, again, we sitting here seeing this can go, man, there's all these interesting connections with and echoes of the endowment. But another way to read this is, man, there's all these interesting echoes of and connection with mass, mm-hmm. right? And um, the Christians were, you know, uh, derided for being a secretive cult, and there were all these rumors about their kinky sex practices because yeah, they yeah. worship behind closed doors, and they talked about love all the time, and they had those secret feasts, and what's up with that? Right. Yeah, and that was uh, like the Romans that were yes. saying that, and they were mm-hmm. called love feasts. They were which called weird. love feasts, yeah. which yeah. sounds scandalous. Well, this is this is a love feast. Yeah. Okay, and it's the the bread is the Yahweh bread. Mm. So, which we are going to see in just a minute, right? Like, like this is an interesting possibility until the Yahweh bread shows up before we're done with this chapter, and then it becomes, oh, of course. So, um, all right. So we pray. Please give us, uh, give us the, give us the Yahweh bread. Um, we have, uh, we have more teachings. Okay, mm-hmm. you. Uh, there's no magic to how I'm breaking these up. Thematically, what it seems like to me is verses 14 and 15 is more moral teaching about forgiveness. Yeah. Right. You you want to forgive because you want to be forgiven. Uh, we then have teaching about fasting and anointing. That's interesting. That suggests maybe people, um, they, they certainly don't start fasting here because we're about to have a feast. Yeah. But it's possible they came fasting. And so it's possible that means they also came anointed. So maybe they came fasting and anointed, and here they had some teaching about fasting and anointing, right? Yeah. Or maybe they came fasting and at this point became anointed. Okay. Um, Now, verses 19 to 24, we get what I think is sort of the last uh, new covenant. Okay. Uh, So uh, this is, this is God and mammon. You got to be all in. Mm -hmm. Choose one. Okay. You can pick a treasure. Either it is the golden box behind the veil over there, God's throne, God's treasure, right? Or it's earth Mm -hmm. and earth treasures. Uh, But, but you can only have um, you can only have one. Now, again, I'm kind of moving fast. Verse Now, now we get to the feast, okay? Yeah. Uh, verse 25 to, uh, I don't know, 30-something here, okay? Um, and, and, and let's go ahead and, and let's read this. Is it okay if we read this? Yeah, let's do okay. it. Okay, all right, <clears throat> I'm going to read this. So, um, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what ye shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on, right? Eat food, drink, clothing. Mm-hmm. Is not life the life more than meat, and bo- the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like unto one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Mm. Now, um, if we rewind and we go back and look more closely at verses 1 to 5 in this chapter. Yeah. There's a couple of references to fa- your father, which is in heaven, uh, which sees in secret, mm-hmm. or with your father, which is in secret, sees. 
implying that God he is present but not visible, visible yet. Visible, yeah. Right? Which makes all the sense in the world if you're in the middle room of the temple and you're standing in front mm-hmm. of the veil and yeah. this stuff is happening, right? God is in secret. He's right over there, mm-hmm. right? But he's here. He, he knows. He, he's yeah. watching. Yeah. So now it appears that God or the Lord, right, shows up. Mm-hmm. And he is the one who feeds you, and he is the one uh, who clothes, clothes you. you. Now, uh, a couple points. Um, I said I thought that the, the priest of the second room is Elijah. Mm-hmm. So one of the reasons why is that Elijah is fed by birds in the book of Kings. Yeah. And we have here a feast with birds. And Elijah is also associated with a story of clothing, right? He passes his mantle on to Elisha. Mm-hmm. And so those are both references, both those are both allusions verses. to mm-hmm. Elijah, right? Um, there's another reason I think we'll get back. Well, I'll, I'll tell you right now. Second Nephi 9, Jacob refers to this passage, to this clothing, um, uh, calls it the robe of righteousness and directly connects it with the resurrection. And again, Elijah is, uh, brought the widow, the son of the widow of Nain back to life. So feasting with the birds and, and clothing and uh, raising from the dead are all signs of Elijah. Okay, so I think the first room is Moses and justice and faith. The second room is Elijah and uh, mercy, uh, and and we'll talk about hope in a little bit. Um, I also said earlier, and we've sort of flown over some of these a bit. I'll point out some more before we're done, though. Um, I said there are reasons to think that the story that's being played out here is the garden story. Yeah. Right? Um who does God clothe in mm-hmm. the Bible? Yeah, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So, again, it, it, there is no better story, right, if you are going to be reenacting a myth. If, if a myth is going to be giving meaning to the ordinance you are performing, the one that is exactly on the nose for being clothed by God is that you are Adam and Eve. Okay? So, now, by the way... Um, Uh, talk about Melchizedek here? Talk about Melchizedek, maybe. Oh, yeah, perfect. I've got some verses up there. Um, Melchizedek is cool. Melchizedek is way cool. I'm mm-hmm. going to say some cool stuff about Melchizedek now. Another guy skipped in the Bible. Another guy, yeah, who is like w- a couple times in the Bible, very provocatively, and then he's a giant elsewhere. Or is he skipped? Oh, dun dun dun. Okay. <laughs> Genesis 14, we meet Melchizedek. He comes uh, and. Uh, has a feast with Abraham, mm-hmm. okay? And Abraham responds apparently by paying him tithing. Yeah. Okay? And um, Melchizedek is introduced. The King James says Melchizedek, the king of Salem. Okay? Now, uh, Salem does appear in the book of Psalms apparently as a poetic name for Jerusalem. But there is no... We don't have any archaeological site of Salem. There's no, we can't go somewhere and say, here is an archaeological dig. This is Mm -hmm. Salem. We found Salem, right? Salem exists in literature as far as we know. And it turns out that in this verse, Genesis 14, 18, um, there may not be a reference to Salem at all because because the Hebrew says, uh, not Melchizedek, uh, king of Salem, but Melchizedek, uh, whose name means something like my king is righteousness or king of righteousness. Yeah. Melech Shalem. Now, Melech Shalem, Melech is the king. Melech Shalem might mean the king of the place called Shalem. Might. Mm-hmm. Or it could mean the king, Melech, who is Shalem. Mm. And again... So with Shalem, peace, we, we talked about that he already. He is the peaceable yeah. or the perfect king. Mm-hmm. Right? Peaceable king. And uh, so it's very interesting that when Alma and Alma 13 talks about him, he calls him the Prince of Peace, mm-hmm. right? Um, so uh, what, what I think we have here is the Lord, who is Melchizedek, yeah, who is the king of the Shalems. I may, and maybe specifically the Lord is the king of the Shalems in this role, right? Maybe that's what it means specifically. The guy who comes down uh, and presides over this peaceable feast, the feast beside the still waters, 
okay? Um, now, by the way, my, his name is my king uh, is righteousness or king of righteousness, right? So remember the beatitude, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness for they should be filled. What are they going to be filled with? Mm. They're be filled with righteousness, right? Blessed are the feast with them. Mm-hmm. They're they're a feast of his flesh, mm-hmm. right? Because it's the ep- because the feast is the Epiusios bread. Mm-hmm. So Melchizedek is Yahweh, and he's presented, and he he is the Lord, mm-hmm. and he brings the feast of his own flesh and blood. And those who have hungered and thirsted after righteousness are filled by having a feast of the Epiusios bread mm-hmm. by eating the bread righteousness. Wow. So um, that's the feast. So there was. Was there eating in the temple? So there was. I think that's in the his whole prior. point: is there was eating there, and the Book of Mormon alludes to this. And that's we'd have to do another episode just on what's going on with ether and the what's the veil, the, the reversal of mm-hmm. the endowment. Well, if but it, if the, it, the eating is going on there. Yeah, and if we want to increase temple attendance in the church, maybe some we should good, take some note. Some eating yeah. in there. Some barbecue. Get a Chick Fil A. In every yeah. temple, yeah, probably not going to happen. <laughs> but but it was it was happening there. And for me, I see it liturgically in the Greek Orthodox and the Catholic tradition, where they're in that room and right. they're eating it because you come to the altar and you look up and there's a circle of people in robes or angels. And anyway, mm. so this stuff's going on. But we, but yeah. we do we do the eating part obviously in church. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. The uh, another place you see that exact there's a three part uh, space sequence in Exodus 24. Yep. where um, uh, the people of Israel stay at the bottom of the mountain. Moses, Joshua, whose name just is literally Jesus, okay, that's not that's just the same name. Moses and Jesus, his right-hand man, go up to the second level with the elders of Israel where they see God, and right? Eat with his him. feet are described, and eat with him. And then Moses and Joshua slash Jesus alone go through a cloud up to the highest level, right? That's Exodus 24. You're seeing the same thing here. It's an ascent through three-part space, passing through a veil. It's on the sacred mountain, and the feast is in the middle part. And everybody's just invited. Like this isn't just for the special people. Like, he 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 wants everybody to come, mm-hmm. right? I mean, that's so important because I think back to earlier, like an hour ago, you know, we talked about how the Bible seems to give this indication that nobody's allowed, and yet... Nephi in the very first verse says, no, I've been initiated. And by the way, it's an invitation to everybody. I mean, we're, we're breaking over all mm-hmm. we can to send out how many missionaries now? 70,000 to the how world many to say no, are we come. Mm-hmm. Well, and this is Matthew, right? Uh, if those who I didn't invite to the wedding feast the first time won't come, I'm, then go out there and bring in all the beggars and the, yeah. the lepers and whoever. We want everyone, right? yeah. It's, yeah. The invitation is to everybody. Wow, yeah. that's awesome. <clears throat> so... Um, there are other texts that I think reflect this. So Exodus 24 is one. Psalm 23, uh, the, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, right? He leadeth me to a feast beside the still waters uh, where I am comforted, um, I think is this scene. Uh, I think that the sacrament prayers in Moroni 4 and 5, Moroni never says, we go to church on Sunday and hear are the prayers we use. Yeah. He just says, here are the prayers we use. Uh, and and we assume a church context, mm-hmm. but there's no reason to assume that. So I think what we might be seeing there are the the temple texts, mm-hmm. right? Where uh, with where you're eating the 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 flesh and drinking the blood, uh, with the promise that you can have His Spirit to be with you, right? I think I think those are temple texts, Interesting. or at least we ought to consider yeah. that they might be. Okay, so like if we're going back to the ancient temple yeah. we're, we're talking sacrament and endowment same I, I, time like I, same time there, there's a certain amount of like analogy in yeah. saying that right so let me just if i parse it different i'd say look here is this ordinance that we appear to experience in sort of two halves yeah and one of them or something like it we would call an endowment mm-hmm. and one of them or something like it we would call the sacrament and they seem to have been one thing, mm. right? And well, and that's a very LDS perspective. Right? For sure. Again, I think some unorthodox person in this conversation might be saying, "What are you talking about? This is clearly mm-hmm. mass." 
Yeah, interesting. And I think one thing that we overlook as well, because there's a lot of things that kind of determine when we take on these covenants. So obviously the washing and anointing and uh, clothing and uh, the endowment, they happen at the same time when that goes through, right? But then we know that there's another level, there's another There's another place to go in the temple, and that's a ceiling room. But it, when you when you do all of them in order, you see that it, it really is kind of one long ordinance. And so you could even throw, you know, baptism in there. Baptism, receiving the priesthood. Because, you know, when we do, um, you know, work for the dead in the temple, we, we have to get, we, we get the baptism for the dead as well as the priesthood also for those who, who have died as well. So I think you can look at all of these ordinances as one long ordinance that we break up for whatever reason, but it's, it's all one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The interesting thing to me, and we'll, we'll come back to this is how it is all um, contrary to the initial impression that it's a scattered series of things Jesus might've said. Yeah. Uh, it's actually a pretty coherent narrative. Yeah, uh, that that incorporates not only all of the text but also uh, the furniture. Hmm. Um, we will come back to that. Okay. Okay. Cool. Uh, we we wind up here uh, at the end of this chapter, uh, verse thirty three, um, saying, "Seek the kingdom of God." And there it is, all along, right? The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, have have kept coming back to us from the Beatitudes uh, all, all the way up to here, um, and. Uh, that's what has to be next, right? What's next is the kingdom of God. Mm. It's Matthew 7. It's the Holy of Holies. Now, and his righteousness, again, I, I read this as, as, as stage decorations. If the Lord came down as Melchizedek and he was the Shalom king and he offered the feast of his own flesh and blood, and now we're being told, follow righteousness, that says to me that Melchizedek has gone back. Mm. Okay. Right? The Lord came down, he participated in the feast, and now he is back in the third room behind the veil, and we're being told to follow him. Right? Seek the kingdom of God. So the holy of whole, like that that third room, yep. and his righteousness, which righteousness, Melchizedek, king of peace, and then the whole righteous thing. Yep. Okay. And that's has and, to be and what's all of these up next. things shall be added unto you. That you're gonna receive the rest of it if you follow. And by the way, things can be things, things, but it can be words. And so in Mm -hmm. the endowment, we get words, but we're told there's going to be words added later. So Mm -hmm. there, I mean, there's layers to this because I read verse 33 simply as live the law of consecration, seek the kingdom of God. Yeah. Dave's saying yes, but he's also saying we're going to the Holy of Holies, Mm -hmm. which I say yes. Yes. So this is multivalent. Yeah. It's like the Book of Mormon. There's levels, right? There's layers. The first layer is this brings you to Christ, and we use it as a proof text. Hey, the restoration happened. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure Nephi is like, awesome, that's level one, but there's more levels. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. By the way, looking at the looking at the diagram reminds me another reason. In fact, the first reason why it, why it sort of struck me that Elijah might be the priest in the in the sort of sequence here. Yeah. Is because remember that in this second room, this is where this is where uh, Zechariah meets the angel Gabriel to the right of the incense altar. Yeah. Okay. And where Gabriel in Luke one tells him about his son's coming mission, which is uh, which is to which is to carry out the role of Elijah to be the priest who comes before the Lord, announcing the arrival of the Lord. Mm. So um, <clears throat> let's look at Matthew seven, mm. and we're again we're we're in turbo mode. We're going very fast here. <laughs> we're so flying. I, I may have to sometimes go back when I've skipped something. So remember, we started six with a discussion of justice. Uh, we start seven with justice again. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, judge not, let the be not judged. You know, the judgment you use is going to be applied to you. Get the beam out of your own eye, you hypocrite. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, the uh, Now, what sense does it make? We've already had discussions of justice. Why now are we getting reminded about justice again? Mm. Because ooh, cause we're moving on to another phase. So yeah. it's like every single phase you go to, yes. you're reminded, hey, Oh, so like at the beginning in Matthew five, there's the it starts off with the penalty, right? Well, it does. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And by the way, so there's the temple recommend interview, and then there's the penalty. There's warning of penalty, and then we yeah. get and then we get justice, and now we're getting justice again. And by the way, we're about to get our own personal judgment. Mm. So this is like your last warning. Here comes justice, buddy. Interesting. Okay, um, verse six. Okay, give not that which is holy unto the dogs. 
right? Now, again, if you just think this is a sermon, all of this seems random. Here's some stuff Jesus said about justice, and now he says, well, don't throw holy things unto dogs. But if we think, no, what's going on is you are now about to enter the holy of holies, and so you're getting one last warning, and the warning is, look, as holy as you think everything you've seen until now is, it's about to get more intense. Mm -hmm. So you do not share this, right? Give not that which is holy unto dogs. By the way, lest they trample them uh, under, their, under their feet, so there's the covenant penalty again, right, is being alluded to. Mm. This is serious mm -hmm. stuff. And turn again and rend you. And so turn there's again a and rend you. There's stuff yeah. going on here. Yeah. <laughs> now, now uh, verse 7 to 8, okay? Gosh. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. So you're led up, you're taught about, you're reminded about justice, you're reminded about sacred things, and then you have a triple petition where you ask, seek, knock to be admitted <laughs> into the kingdom of heaven. Okay? Oh my gosh. It's here, and right? Then, then it's you're just doing all this, here. You have this exchange of messianic symbols going on next. Right? Yeah. Now, there's this really interesting bit here, uh, 9 and 10, where... Um, weird. It's weird. It, it is weird, yeah. and, and I don't have a full answer here, but I have, like, there's, it's, it's provocative, okay? Yeah. What man is there of you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Well, that's weird because, in fact, on the other side of the veil, in, in Matthew 6, you had bread, and on the Matthew 7 side, there is a stone, mm -hmm. right? So, like, that's odd, bread and a stone. And then uh, 10, or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? And that's weird because... Prior to Hezekiah's reforms, there was also a serpent inside the veil. There was the, the serpent on the Nehushtan. Yeah. So at one time, there was a boulder and a brass serpent behind the veil. So it's really provocative the verses refer to that. I also don't know if lumping bread and fish together mm -hmm. is a reference to the feedings of the multitudes. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know, right? But I, do, I think that means there's a thing here that... I can't quite see. I don't think it's nonsense. I think I don't understand it quite. Yeah. Um, but but I, I do like them as messianic symbols. Yeah. hundred percent. There, there's ex all, all, all four of them. All four. Right. And because, and the, because the value the Nephites give to the Nehushtan is unambiguously positive. Yeah. It's Jesus. Yeah. Well, because it's repeated. It's not just once in there. It's right. It's repeated and they do look at it. Like you say, how did you say it? the reverence they give it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's, this is, an, this is a thought that I had just barely. So there's the, the man who is, so there's the messianic symbol side. So he's essentially talking about messianic symbols and he's saying, he's essentially saying if something is asked for, then you give them, then this. you give that. Yes. There's you don't exchange. give them something else. And so this idea, you knock the three knocks, right? Yep. They get you in. Then some things are going to be presented to you and you better give them. If, if you're asked, oh, a yeah, fish, interesting. Get, he better get a fish. Boy, and there are four, so that's also provocative. And uh, I'm having a stroke it, here. We're going to see the number of four it, in our yeah, next session. It's just something to consider. And I think that it, I don't think it's one thing. I think no. it could be lots yeah, of different things. Yeah, it's multiple things. things. Yep, I think that's exactly right. Interesting. So mm. um, the four signs, there's four signs that he talks about that are messianic symbols Yeah. there. And he's like, if I ask for one of them, you don't give me the other. That might be right. That might be right. Like life, right? It's like hypothesis to a certain extent. Here's yeah. what I think I'm seeing, right? So <clears throat> I think I see a sequence of three priests, Moses, Elijah, the Lord. Mm -hmm. I think I see three spiritual gifts. We'll probably come back and talk about that. Faith, hope, charity. Um, uh, I think I see three kind of uh, principles of, of uh, justice, right, uh, or juridical principles. So just the first room is the room of justice, dikaios une, and then there's elemos une, the room of mercy, Yeah. when the Lord himself appears and, and meets you and brings you a feast, and, and you see him come through the veil, so you see flashes of the kingdom of God on the other side. And, um, and, uh, and then I think 11 and 12 maybe, right, we're, we're getting, um, I, I, I don't know what you call this, um, maybe it's justice, mercy, and then grace. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of texts refer to the joy of being in the kingdom of heaven, um, but I like 11 and 12 because they're, they're, all, they're about abundance living. They're about giving to all, right? Like I've gotten beyond where I got to do what I'm told or, or I get punished. And I've gotten beyond even where 
I, I sin and I need mercy, and like I can just abundantly give, right? Mm-hmm. I'm living in a state of grace. Um, is the is the being in the, being in the rest of God? Yeah. Um, now verses thirteen, right? Remember, we just asked, sought, and knocked. Verse thirteen: Enter ye in at the straight gate. After you ask, seek, and knock. After we have the four messianic signs, you pass through some kind of narrow entrance, right? Um, and uh, there's this interesting, uh, it appears here but also elsewhere, there's some kind of alternative, mm. right? Wide is the gate and broad is the way. Um, Helaman, I think Helaman 3 has a passage like this too, where you, you, you can either enter into the gate or you fall into the abyss. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, straight is the gate, narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. Now, life is super interesting. Okay, um, the tree of life. Okay, um, the uh, Hebrew prophets. For the Hebrew prophets, the one of the most sacred and powerful modes of communication was the pun. Okay, the ultimate dad language. Yes. Uh, Adam means dirt, <laughs> okay? Um, Eve means life. And so when Adam says, I will call her Eve, for she is the mother of all living, uh, what he's saying in Hebrew is, I will name her Hava, for she is the mother of every high. Well, actually, the pun was so important to the Hebrew prophets, okay, mm-hmm. that... Um, when they translated the Old Testament into Greek down in Alexandria in 300 BC, the Septuagint, and they got to this passage, the pun was felt to be more important than the actual name. So they preserved the, the pun, the pun over the name. The same word. And so Adam in Greek says, I shall name her Zoe, for Wait, she is Eve. the mother of Eve. all the Zoontone. Yeah, you said you said Adam. Sorry. At Adam will name her. A- oh, sorry. Didn't I get go it right? On, go on. Yeah, you're you're doing maybe not. Okay. Come on, no, right? you're doing great. But you are <laughs> back to you no, doing I'm, your It homework. is Adam names Eve, right? Yeah. At, Adam says, "I will name her Zoe." Yeah. Eve's Eve's name in Genesis four is Zoe. Is Zoe. Yes. Because she's the mother of all the Zoontone, the living ones. Mm. Right. The pun is important. Eve is connected with the tree. Is connected with life. So this straight and narrow gate that we pass through goes to life. Now we're warned about, hey, there are false alternatives, okay? There are false prophets uh, with bad fruits. Now there's this, uh, this fantastic, do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Thistles and thorns are acanthi and triboloi in Greek. What is that? <laughs> It's, well, this oh, is the Greek word. Oh, that, that, that's the Greek word. Okay. But we, but <laughs> I thought you said they are them. Oh, you're what like, the <laughs> Dave, this is not helpful. Yeah. <laughs> Aca- the, the words are in Greek, akanta and triboloi, which when in Genesis 5, Adam and Eve are cast out of the garden and the ground gets thistles and thorns, it gets akanta and triboloi, Right. And so here we have it coming up as we're passing through the through a straight and narrow gate to life, and we're warned about Akanthi and Triboloi. It, it's as if those thistles and thorns, um, maybe yes, they are the curse of the earth after the fall, but they're also like a wall like a barrier. around Eden. They're yeah. like a barrier. You're passing through the wall of Akanthi and Triboloi, the narrow gate to get to uh, life. Now, life should be a tree. Is, is it a tree? Well, look what we get in verse 17. Every good fruit bringeth forth, or sorry, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. We're back to the tree. We're back, we're back to the tree mm-hmm. with good fruit. Okay? So, so I like that idea of the, the thorns and thistles as code words. Adam and Eve leave God's presence, sacred space. They come to the world of thorns and thistles. Jesus is now reversing the fall because that's what the temple does. We're leaving the space of thorns and thistles, going through the wall and into his space. And as soon as I get there, what do I see? The tree with the good tree. fruit. What does Nephi see in First Nephi 8? The preeminent the bit. The tree now, with good fruit. Now listen fruit. to this. This might be crazy. So sorry if you guys think this is crazy. If they think it's you, crazy, they turned it off an hour yeah. ago. <laughs> true. <laughs> it's so true. So, oh, um, yeah, for, so for you five listeners, yeah, for you five left. viewers left, all five of you. So correct. <laughs> literally, to pass into life, you pass through a narrow and straight gate. That's what it says. Anyone who watches 
a child be born. Oh, yeah. What happens? Oh, and they man. immediately yes. come out into mortality that is filled with the thorns and thistles, the uncomfortableness yeah. of not being in the womb. And then what is the first thing they see? Their mother. Yeah. Yes. The tree. By the way, that's Israel, the birth of Israel. They come out of Mitzrayim, which literally, if you translate it and you nerd out with the, the language, I'm coming from straight spaces. That's mm. why Egypt is the place of confinement mm. or straight tight because they're in bondage yeah. so i'm coming out of mitzrayim out of the straight space and so one rabbi i read said egypt is the womb yeah. they're coming out of the womb through the waters and to be gate. reborn that is so amazing like Before i'm just i'm thinking right now because you know i watched my kids too. like your your head li- the child's head literally has yeah. to smash to come out and to come into life like that yeah. narrow and straight gate one baby can come out at a time so this rebirth of you know enter into the gate and then like this seeing the tree thing too like yeah. holy there's, cow there's you're yeah. you're like we're right at the edge of a big archetypal conversation that we probably don't have time to have here too right oh my gosh which is because like alma says alma 13 that this stuff goes back to the beginning and everyone had it mm-hmm. um and and you, you when you run up against points like this right that you, you kind of want to say well, to some extent, is what we're seeing just archetypally embedded into human, human beings, experience, like that's how we see. into our consciousness? Carl Jung, basically. It's right. our collective yeah. unconscious. Right. And, and so, so, Dave, maybe you know, you're know you over-egging this because it, it would kind of be everywhere you look. And, and my answer to that is I think it is everywhere you it's look. Both. And the reason is because Alma says this goes back to the beginning. And I think it's in the night sky and the stars. And I think mm-hmm. it is embedded in our, our universal human experience. And that's because... The gospel is not supposed to, again, to get back to where we're at the beginning, the gospel is not like a hidden little thing that only a few people can have. It's, it's dispersed it's in us. signs and wonders and symbols all around earthly life because everybody, right, the Mongolian shepherd girl with her falcon is a child of God as much as I am, mm-hmm. right? And she may not... Read the Book of Mormon in her mortal life. But, but she has have a, a lot of other falcon. kinds of experience. She has a falcon. She's, <laughs> and you don't have she's a falcon. way cooler than I am. She probably knows the who personally, right? So, um, uh, sorry, I, I had to say that. Go on. It's, well, it's her and her RFK Jr. apparently has a falcon. Has a falcon, too. Uh, yeah, he's a falconer, uh, apparently. So, um, so, so, yeah, so I think there is an extent to which, like, you do DNA. see these things everywhere. And I think that is a sign of their that this is this is an ancient path again that we're all on right. It's it is esoteric, but at the same time, it's not like you have no choice to be in this path. I, mm-hmm. Either you're on it and doing poorly, or you're on it and making progress. But you're on it. Yeah. Right. This is the path for every child of God. Like we can understand genetics, but either way, whether or not we understand genetics genetics affect you, you're, us you're right we are we are filled with other. genes <laughs> and so i think that's kind of but once you understand genetics you're able to use your genetics hopefully you know to so we are we are in the plan of salvation no matter what but if you understand you're in the plan of salvation then you're able to able to make the right decisions maybe you can make better choices for other people as well as, well. as for yourself right mm-hmm. yeah um, yeah. So uh, we're not quite done yet. So uh, <laughs> verses 21 to 23, we were warned that judgment was coming, right? And here it is. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, gets to go into the kingdom of heaven, right? This is where we the kingdom of heaven. Uh, so who does get to go? Well, you know, uh, uh, people who just who don't do the work, even, even if they cast out devils and do wonderful things, but they, they may nevertheless uh, be cast out. Who gets to get in? Those who hear these sayings and does them. Mm-hmm. That's how you get through the judgment. And by the way, I will liken him unto a wise man. No, I think this is the second title that's being given to you. You're first called the perfect or the peaceable, mm-hmm. and we saw that showing up in Moroni and in DNC. Yeah. And here, and then you were called wise. Mm-hmm. And it says the wise man uh, builds his house upon. A rock. The foundation stone. And here's the rock. Mm-hmm. And we're in that third and final room. And, oh, and so you the, are the sitting priest, on the throne of there, God. And he's pointing. A wise man builds his house here. Yeah. Oh, that's very interesting. Yes. Right? This yeah. is where the wise man builds his house. That's right. Hmm. That's cool. 
So, um, by the way, I like the end of this chapter. Uh, and it came to pass when Jesus ended these sayings, people were astonished. <laughs> I bet they were. Mm -hmm. I bet they were. They're confused. A lot of them were confused. Oh, I think, well, I think a lot of them were confused. Um, and by the way, there may well be people who have stuck with us the entire time. I don't know if we're like two hours into this or what. Yeah, there's like, like there's three left. We had five, but we dropped off to three. <laughs> yeah, with down. my comment. And they were like, all right, they're down. childbirth thing, I'm out. And one, of, one of them's your mom. And they're yeah. self-medicating. <laughs> so, um, okay, so uh, we're not quite done yet. We're, 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 we're almost done. Um, what is this ordinance? We, we've really talked about this already. It, mm -hmm. it is something like what we would know as an endowment, but it is also something like we would know as a mass or as a sacrament, right? Yeah. Maybe it's the ancient Christian love feast. You ascend to meet God on the mountain, right? You receive teachings, you make covenants. It's a drama at which uh, the, we're going to see more evidence for this, and the Book of Mormon is full of it. Mm -hmm. uh, Adam and Eve seem to be the story of the drama. And by the way, think about that, okay? Um, the the book of Genesis starts with two trees, life and good and evil in the garden, okay? And, uh, and, and then the New Testament ends, Revelations 22, with a vision of the Holy of Holies with God's throne. So that's how we know it's the Holy of Holies, and there's a tree. So the Bible is a journey from two trees to one tree. Well, the passage through the temple, from the outside to the inside, you start with those two pillars, Boaz and Yaquim. And they are trees. Which are trees. And you end by the tree with good fruits. And so it's, it's a linear, straight-to-the-center journey. But the narrative seems to be you're Adam and Eve, you're cast out, you, you do what needs to be done to come back into the presence of the, of the one tree, the tree of life. Now, <clears throat> let, me, let me say, touch on the Beatitudes here briefly, okay? The seven blessings are your promise that you'll see God, that you'll inherit the earth, that you will be filled with righteousness, that you will be comforted, that you'll be called the children of God, that you'll obtain mercy, and that you'll receive the kingdom. Well, how does this mm. ordinance appear to climax? Well, God comes down into the hay call with you, so you see God, mm -hmm. right? Um, he clothes you like Adam, who was given dominion over the earth. So you become the heir, Adam's heir, you inherit the earth. Um, you have a feast where you, you are filled with righteousness. You're filled with the flesh and blood of the Lord. You are filled with righteousness. Uh, you are comforted. My rod and my staff, they comfort you, right? The, the sacrament blessings, uh, that they may have his spirit to be with comforter. them. The presence of the spirit of the comforter is, is the hallmark of the, of the temple feast. You approach God as his child and ask him, for a blessing, right? Mm -hmm. What man, if his son asked for a fish, would give him or yeah. would give him a serpent, right? You you're, prove that you're his son by by receiving the gift by that knowing he gives the four you. messianic, yeah. So uh, you, you promised you'll obtain mercy. Well, you pass through your judgment. If you get all the way through, you must obtain mercy, and and the upshot of that is that you receive the kingdom, right? So the seven beatitudes, which again might be sort to a conventional scholar might seem like well here's some <clears throat> random stuff maybe he took this from the gospel of thomas mm -hmm. or whatever also describe the climax of the ordinance which strongly suggests that um that we're not seeing things right like it's tight it's self-consistent it it corroborates uh it corroborates the reading now um we'll talk about that thing later um, let's just talk very quickly about 2 Nephi 9. We're not going to read it. I'm just going to talk you through it because we've been going for like three hours or <laughs> yeah, something. Yeah, good. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk you through it quickly, uh, and, and a person who's watching can go look on the room. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. 2 Nephi 9 is Jacob. Nephi gives us no context for this. He doesn't say why Jacob is having Has this microphone. speech, right? Uh, I mean, we know he's a priest. Uh, but we don't know, you know, it's not like, oh, this is on the high holy day or it was my birthday and after the cake, Jacob said the following. Speech, There's a speech, lot of scholars speech. who think this is a Feast of Tabernacles, which is once again a temple festival speech, but we don't know. Or a day of atonement. I've heard yeah, the hypothesis yeah. that it was a day of, a day of atonement. Either way. Um, 
if you go through and read this passage, okay, first of all, you get a whole bunch of Adam and Eve discussion. The mm-hmm. background here uh, is is the fall, uh, at ver- uh, verses 6 and 7, uh, conflict with the adversary, verses 8 and 9. Um, the uh, Jacob talks about uh, putting on the robe of righteousness in verse 7 and verse 14. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, in this context where we've got Satan on the scene, there's the, uh, the Eden story is at issue. Uh, we are being clothed. Uh, verse 15, we appear before uh, the judgment seat um, to go through our judgment and inherit the kingdom. Um, the, uh, so there's all these uh, resonances, okay, with uh, with the Sermon on the Mount mm-hmm. um, and uh, this discussion of what is wisdom. Wisdom is hearkening to the counsel of God. We'll talk in our next session about what counsel is. It's a super interesting word. Uh, setting your heart on earthly treasure is breaking your covenant, right? That's Matthew chapter 6. Now you're going, Dave, this is all okay, whatever, but show me some meat. Okay, verses 30 to 38. Actually, I'm going to read this. Second Nephi 9, verses 30 to 38, because this is where you're like, mm-hmm. oh, man, boom. Point the microphone a little bit more towards you. Second Nephi 9, 30 to 38, except my app is not wanting to cooperate. You can use mine. Can I? Yep. Okay. And, I, and you can make it big so you don't even have to wear glasses uh, if you don't want. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my book doesn't do that. Mike, how does, <laughs> yeah. your, how does I know, your book it's, work? It's, ma- it's this magic thing. Okay. Um, there's an article back in the 90s. When I was in college, Farms was publishing a lot of good Book of Mormon stuff. Okay. Yeah. Like, Book of Mormon is an ancient document kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And there was an article that said, oh, here Jacob is giving his set of new, his set of new Ten Commandments for the Nephites. Okay. These, here are the alleged uh, new Ten Commandments. Okay. Woe unto the rich who are rich as to the things of this world. Because they are rich, they despise the poor, and they persecute the meek, and their hearts are upon their treasures. Wherefore, their treasure is their God, and behold, their treasure will perish with them also. And woe unto the deaf that will not hear, for they shall perish. Woe unto the blind that will not see, for they shall perish also. Woe unto the uncircumcised of heart, for a knowledge of their iniquities shall smite them at the last day. Woe unto the liar, this is my favorite, for he shall be thrust down to hell. Woe unto the murderer who deliberately killeth, for he shall die. Woe unto them who commit whoredoms, for they shall be thrust down to hell. Also good. Yea, woe unto those that worship idols, for the devil of all devils delighteth in them. And in fine, woe unto all those who die in their sins. For they shall return to God and behold his face and remain in their sins. Now, there's a basic problem. There are two basic problems with thinking that this is a new Ten Commandments. There's only nine of them. (laughs) There's only nine of them is the first problem. There's not ten. Mm -hmm. Okay? And the author of the the article was kind of like, well, but it's close. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's close, but it's wrong. Yeah. (laughs) Okay? There aren't nine commandments, but there are nine something else. Mm-hmm. The penalties in the... There are nine Beatitudes. Oh, the Beatitudes. There, and how does the Beatitude, how's the Beatitude structured? Bless Blessed are so-and-so, for they'll get such-and-such. Such. Well, look at this. Woe unto those who commit whoredoms, for they shall be thrust down to... These are negative Beatitudes. Oh. They're not commandments. The commandments don't sound like this, Mm-mm. right? The commandments, thou shalt not kill, mm-hmm. right? Thou shalt not bear false witness. These are Beatitudes, did Jack Welch point this out when he was doing his no, Beatitudes? No, because okay. he does not know everything. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> but, this, but, this, but, but we love. I love you, Jack. Welch. But Jack but now he legend. does. He's he's one of the three. Yeah. And he's he's working on a like a scotch, and he's like you know he's yeah, yeah. into it. So uh, just he, I'm sure he doesn't drink. So um, <laughs> the number of them is the number of Beatitudes in Matthew five, and the structure of them is that they are inverted Beatitudes yeah. instead of. The, theirs is the kingdom of God thrust down to hell. That's exactly Wait, right. But why? Well, that's a really good question. <laughs> why? Why would why would Jake? What what sense would it make for Jacob? This is where we get into like we're trying to make sense of the Book of Mormon, right? That's the point here. Yeah. What sense does it make that Jacob seems to have? He's using beatitude language, just the right number, and it's structured like beatitudes to like lambast these people. How do we make the most sense out of that? 
please please teach us <laughs> does it suggest jacob is familiar with the beatitudes Probably. It does? Yeah. Does it suggest his audience is familiar with the Beatitudes? Yeah. Probably does, right? They, they regard uh, it as yeah, like authoritative. And, and, and so when he's setting this up and he's talking about the Garden of Eden and watch out for Satan and you're going to get your judgment, and then he's like, nine anti-Beatitudes, right? Mm -hmm. It's because in the sermon he's ripping them a hole, right? In language that they recognize as authoritative, in language that is their own temple language, mm. in language that they heard when they were making covenants of the sort that they're breaking now. Okay. And, and the text shows us this. I mean, if you read verse 41 and 42, we're doing this all over again. It's Sweet. the same stuff. Look, so, look, look in 41 and 42 and just start highlighting Mike, stuff. Mike, why like, don't you read this? Because I have not yeah, told you to read. Why don't you read, read just, 41 and 42? Yeah, I mean, it's just right it. here. He says, Oh, then, my beloved brethren, come unto the Lord, the Holy One. Remember that his paths are righteous, Zedek. Behold, the way for man is narrow, and it lieth in a straight course before him. And the keeper of the gate is the Holy One of Israel, and he employeth no servant there. So the, the, the priest is Yahweh. Mm. There is none other way, save it be by the gate, for he cannot be deceived, for the Lord God is his name. And whoso knocketh, there we go again, to him will he open, and the wise, we're back to that, the wise, prudent people, and the learned and they that are rich and puffed up because of their learning and their wisdom and their riches, yea, they that are they are they whom he despiseth, and save they shall cast these things away and consider themselves fools before God and come down in the depths of humility, he will not open unto them. So there's this idea of true wisdom versus false wisdom going on in verse forty two, but we're mm -hmm. knocking, we're opening, there's an individual there who is the holy one and what are we doing? He's We're asking to come into that space. Yeah, I mean that's that's how I. Read Gosh, it. and so I guess what. Hundred percent. How I'm look, understanding this. By the way, this. verse forty-five. Uh, we we get what's behind the gate? The rock of the your rock. salvation. The rock of your which salvation, is, which is in that room. That's awesome. Yeah, go ahead, Hayden. I was just gonna say. So I guess this <laughs> is just an evidence that the Beatitudes really is an ordinance. Like the Book of Mormon is that witness that's saying, because Jesus hasn't come yet. He's still 600 years, you know, 550 years away. Right. But these these nine things that line up with the Beatitudes, that's that's showing that those Beatitudes didn't find their origin in Christ on that mountain, but they found They're their older. origin older than yeah. that. Yeah. Jesus is an inheritor and a passer on of a tradition that's before him. Mm -hmm. Right. He's not making up new things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and part of that tradition is this ordinance, which he teaches, uses to teach people, yeah. which seems to have been known to the Nephites. And here, and, and 2 Nephi 9 is a great example. There are, there are a bunch of others, okay? If you read 2 Nephi 4, the so-called Psalm of Nephi, Lehi is dead, Nephi is consoling himself. What does he console? How does he console himself? It's all this same language. Let me stay in the plain road and get through the narrow gate and let me come build upon your rock, Lord. He's, say, ask, he's saying a prayer of consolation to himself using all this same language. Why? Because Nephi is an initiated man, mm -hmm. and he expects that you are too. Lehi in first Nephi, uh, Second Nephi 1 is exhorting his sons Laman and Lemuel, okay? And he says, rise up out of the dust and be men and put on your clothing, the armor of righteousness, I think he says, mm -hmm. and come forth out of darkness into light. And this is the language of the ordinance. Yeah. And he's urging them to take up the part of Adam and, and be clothed. And, and again, that makes the most sense if not only Lehi, but also Nephi, who's writing it down, and also Laman and Lemuel understand that language. And Nephi thinks that we'll understand it too. Mm. And by the way, this stuff, this is a whole other podcast, but Isaiah 26 is doing this, and it's clear to me in the Hebrew, and it's totally lost in the English. So yeah. I'm a big fan of Isaiah 26 in the Hebrew, which is the same stuff as we're rising up, coming out of darkness, and going to the light, which mm. is what Lehi is saying. Oh but gosh. it's written in such plain language that when I was eight and I read it, I had one version, which is great. But I think Dave's saying, no, this is temple language, and he's right. Like, it's both. And so the Book of Mormon can hit you at the primary level, but if you keep reading and you keep doing this stuff, it just continues to have relevance. But Joseph made it all up. Right. Dude, but what's crazy <laughs> as well is that it matches up with seven repeated punishments. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because there's only... It's yeah, nine, it repeats perish it's and nine thrust down to hell. 
So there's only oh, interesting. So there's seven. So it's an Did exact. Match. I didn't even notice that before. <laughs> <laughs> you are a beast. You got to rewrite, <laughs> rewrite your books. Well done. <laughs> there's only seven repeated punishments. Okay, so That's what are cool. the odds, right? Again, Joseph, <laughs> the witnesses say he put his face in a hat and dictated this. Like, this is not how people make things up. Holy it just isn't. Bro. Dude, Joseph Smith. Oh, hey, for Smith. the four yeah. of you that are still here. One person one retuned in. <laughs> Hi, Mom. Someone, someone walked in the back of the room. What is that? This is delicious, okay? Um, I don't even know what to say. Just, sh- just sh- share this with someone that you think will appreciate it. Uh, we love you for sticking through and listening. This is not the only time. I, I don't know if we're going to be able to convince him to stay and record another episode right now. Maybe we can. Um, but there's going to be more. David, thank you. Remind me, where can people buy uh, your books? Uh, so so the two books I have on this subject uh, are called Plain and Precious Things. I forget the subtitles actually. And, Plain, the, and, and the goodness and the mystery. The goodness, and it's probably worth reading them in order. You know, don't read it, this one first. It's awesome, but you got to read Plain and Precious Things yeah. first. And and it's under my general authority name, D. John Butler. Um, <laughs> you sound so official. Or like a mustard joke, right? One of the two. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I get it. I'm a little slow Dijon. today. Dijon. Dijon. Right. Dijon. Yeah. Is that Dijon or Grey Poupon? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> what, cool. what did you call it? A mustard joke? Um, a, a mustard joke, oh, yeah. That's so um, good. Yeah, they're just on Amazon. All right, yeah. Okay. Okay. We'll get them. And until next time, stay curious and hungry. <laughs>